This is really interesting. Look at this oil. We didn't do anything to introduce that much moisture into the system. I'm wondering if their oil's contaminated in their brand new compressor. I, I don't understand. We're gonna keep trying to do oil changes on this, but there's no reason for this because we purged with nitrogen, we had nitrogen flowing. Um, yeah, unless the nitrogen's contaminated. I've never seen that before. That's interesting. Well, we're gonna keep doing oil changes. I've got a couple other little guys here, so just keep doing them and hope that oil clears up. This video is brought to you by Sporlin. Quality, integrity, and tradition. So this is a little bit different. The complaint actually today is that the restroom is hot, okay? And so we came up onto the roof and I made some assumptions and I was incorrect on my assumptions, okay? So um, I assumed that the restroom was controlled by the kitchen AC, which is right here. But the kitchen AC was working, okay? We went to the restroom exhaust, which is in that corner right over there. Restroom exhaust is working. So our next step was to go climb into the restroom and trace out the ductwork. It was a little difficult to do so, but it looked like it could have been coming from the kitchen AC, all right? But I also kind of wondered if it was coming from that AC, because the restroom, mind you, is over here. Well, we did a little bit more investigating. I had another technician here with me, and I had him go into the restroom, because there was air blowing out. Had him put his hands on the vents, and I shut off this AC, and the air kept moving, and I shut off this AC, and the air kept moving. So I'm like, what the heck? And then I'm thinking, well, what other AC could it be? And I, I can't see it being this one. So we went over to this one, which is their bar AC. And uh, sure enough, the restroom is being teed off from this unit right here and running all the way across the building. So we know that our problems with this AC, now they're not complaining about their bar area being hot, so I'm a little intrigued. Um, now that we've figured out this is the unit, we come up to it and I want to check the belt. So we're going to open this guy up. I have it shut off at the disconnect switch, so we're good on that. And we come over here to the belt and it's a little loose. It's not horrible, but it's definitely loose. And I went through the Prodigy board, which is right here, and it has all these freeze stat errors. I'm kid not kidding you, maybe like 20 of them over the last two months. Freeze stat, freeze stat, freeze stat, freeze stat. So I cleared all the freeze stat errors and we're gonna dive into this guy. So we very well might have a refrigeration problem. That we're gonna have to check. We're gonna tighten up that belt and then we're gonna probe up on first and second stage and then see what the pressures look like and how the unit's operating. Okay, my first stage doesn't look horrible. I mean, head pressure's a little bit low. Um, Superheat's a little bit high. Subcoin's about where it should be. This also has no load whatsoever. It's 62 degree return air temperature right now. Um, temp split's low. And that's interesting. I jumped over to the second stage and look at the superheat. Extremely low superheat, so it's flooding back. Subcooling is lower than the other one. I'd expect it to be a little bit higher. Um, yeah, that's interesting. What is going on with the other valve versus this valve? Do we have some problems here? Huh. We still don't have a great temperature split either. It's very interesting. Yeah. So, if we come in here, we've got both of our sensing bulbs. Here's one TXV right here. And then the other TXV is down here, sensing bolt, back down here. None of them are loose. They're where they should be. Um, I closed the outside air damper. Interesting. We're doing a temperature check across the dryer. So it was 87 degrees on this side of the dryer and it's 86 degrees on the other side of the dryer. That's for one stage. All right, that's one dryer right there. That's the second dryer. So we're 93 degrees on both sides of that dryer. So the dryer's not plugged up, but we definitely have a significant liquid temperature difference across the two. So one of them's an 83 degree liquid line, one of them's a 93 degree liquid line. So we got something going on here. Oh. It's interesting about the TXVs, but I kind of feel like we need to recover the charge and start from there. This is a 410 with a micro channel. I think our best bet is to recover the charge and weigh in 
factory charge and see where it goes from there. The TXVs are not adjustable. I don't really see any problems with the TXVs. I mean, not a whole lot that can go wrong with them besides a power head failure or something. So we're gonna start by recovering the charge and seeing where that gets us. I wanted to test something. So um, with both compressors running, I had Y2 and Y1 calling. My VFD was running at 58 hertz or 53 hertz. I pulled off second stage and it slowed down to 38. So I wanted to make sure that we were speeding up to proper settings and we were. So I just clicked it back on and we should speed up. If it grabbed it, it's a little loose. Yeah, it's in there. So we should speed up. There we go, we went up to 53 hertz. So that's a two speed blower. So it slows down and speeds up with first and second stage. So we're good on that. All right, that code just happened right now. All right, we're gonna go get the recovery equipment. We're gonna pull the charge and weigh it back in. It's always important to understand this has never been used before and it wasn't in a vacuum. We're gonna be reusing the gas that I'm putting into it. So we gotta pull a good evacuation on it to make sure that you know we have a clean vessel for the new refrigerant to go into. So we're pulling the evacuation. We got the recover machine ready. We're gonna just be pulling through gauges because I don't have all my fancy fittings and everything, which will be fine. So we're just about ready. I suspect that the second stage is gonna be fine. I suspect the first stage is gonna be low on refrigerant, but um, we're just gonna pull them both because it's not gonna take long at all, so. All right, I got everything purged all the way to my tank. I opened up my tank. We're pushing in what we can before we turn on the machine. So it's gotten about almost a pound. At this point, we go ahead and hit the machine. Soft startup, good to go. Let it run. We're weighing everything as it's coming out. Second stage is almost done recovering. We've just about recovered six pounds of gas and we're just about out. So it looks like second stage might be about a pound shy on its charge, but um, that wouldn't really add up to why we were flooding back on this one. But still, we'll make sure we top it off accordingly. We still got a little bit more to go, so I'm gonna let it keep running. All right, we are, at, like I said, it is dragging. Uh, it's at two PSI, but at the same time, I fully understand that I'm pulling through Schrader's. I'm using normal hoses. I am not making this a fast process at all. And I'm not upset about that. I just have to know your limitations, okay? It's gonna take longer. Um, but I still have a larger diameter output hose and a larger diameter hose going to the tank also. At the same time, we are leak checking the first stage so that way we're not wasting time because the first stage still has gas in it. And we were picking up a couple little traces down in here, but it hasn't been able to pinpoint anything as of yet. All right, now both stages were low on gas. The first stage more so than the second stage, but both of them were low. We already did a quick leak check, you know, and we didn't see anything, but this time we're gonna investigate the evaporator a little bit more. I've seen a lot of these Linux units leak right in the middle of the evaporator coil. Um, it may be a very small leak. We may not be able to find it, who knows? So we're just gonna do, you know, the best we can. We're not gonna fill the system up with nitrogen. It wasn't that short, so. This is the first stage. Uh, we've got a 17 degree temp split. That's just about what we're actually aiming for. Or the target's 18 degrees right now. Um, this is the first stage. The superheat is throttling as the valve's kind of adjusting. The system's still stabilizing out. Subcooling's about 20 degrees. Um, pressures are looking a lot better on the first stage now that we've added a little refrigerant. We cannot find a leak on this guy, but again, I didn't pressurize with nitrogen. We just did a quick leak search, nothing. So at this point, we're gonna go ahead and jump over to the second stage and see what that one's looking like. This is the second stage. Um, it's not looking too scary. I don't like that low superheat, but the system's still kind of pulling down. So that expansion valve is gonna be moving back and forth. Um, we're gonna do one last, uh, looks like we lost our supply air temperature sensor right now, but we're gonna do one last uh, temperature check across the dryers, make sure there's nothing funky going on there. But other than that, I'm just gonna tell them to keep an eye on it. Well, today we have a compressor swap on this guy. Um, this guy right here, we diagnosed it as being bad. So we got to kind of figure out the best way to do this. As you can see, that compressor is really kind of tucked in there and it's going to be an awkward um, removal. But uh, we'll see what we can get to. We also got to change the liquid line filter dryer, but we're going to start. We went ahead and brought the entire contents of our van onto the roof. We're going to get recovering and then uh, start swapping out the compressor. Try to make everything easy. So we're getting the recovery machine started right now. 
Uh, we just started it up, all right? Field piece MR45. Uh, we're using large diameter hoses. So we are using gauges. Um, we did remove the Schrader on this one. We cannot remove the Schrader on this one because it's too tight in there. So we're doing our best. More than likely, we're gonna watch the, the discharge pressure of this guy as it climbs. I suspect we're gonna have to get a bucket of ice because of uh, the high temperatures. It's probably about 80 degrees outside right now and this is 410A. That's expected. So with that being said, we weighed the cylinder because it does have a little bit of refrigerant in it. We weighed it before even though we've got a scale on here right now, if we end up having to put ice on there, we're gonna have to pull the cylinder off. But because we weighed it before, we'll still be able to keep track of how much gas is in it. So yeah, while we're waiting for that to recover, we'll uh, start sanding everything up and getting ready for the swap. If you pay attention to things, when you're recovering, you know, uh, look at how much gas the system takes. It takes seven pounds, four ounces. We recovered six pounds, 12 ounces. So that's not bad. I mean, you know, it's a little bit off, but it's not bad. So I'm not really gonna be too concerned about a giant leak on this system. Now, if we only recovered two pounds or something like that, then yeah, I'd be more concerned. But um, no, I'm, I'm pretty confident that, you know, we're, we're doing okay. Um, we noticed though, that when we pulled this guy off, that the, the cap had pressure. So that's a, a potential leak source for sure. Um, okay, so we're gonna start disassembling everything, pulling out the compressor. We're gonna try to make this as easy as possible. This discharge line right here is in our way and it's gonna make it hard to get that compressor out. But if you just cut it right here, you pull the whole discharge line assembly out of the way and then we put a coupling right here. So gotta think smart here, make it easy. If usually, not always, but usually, if you're struggling and something is really difficult, you're usually doing something wrong or you need to stop and think about it for a minute because there's usually an easy way. Now, I realize that sometimes some people set some things up crazy, but Usually you can look at it and be like, oh, there's an easier way to do it. Okay, we've got the nitrogen flowing through here. We went ahead and cut this guy, and now we're gonna unsweat the suction line and then take the discharge line out. Now, to unsweat the suction line, we're gonna very carefully use the discharge line as our leverage point, and we're just gonna push with the lineman pliers. Boom, pop it out, and then once we do that, we'll pull the discharge line out, and then we'll get swapping it out. Now these compressor plugs, a lot of people get really frustrated with them. You typically don't have to oil them or anything like that. It requires one side going in, then forward or upward pressure and spin it and it'll pop up into it. It takes a minute to get used to them, but it will, once you get it, you realize, you know, it's a lot easier. See, you're pulling down, I can tell. So you wanna push up the entire time you're turning. There you go, you got it. Okay, so there's no need to oil them. Again, most of the time you don't need to, so. And then once you figure it out, it becomes a lot easier. Just the upward pressure the entire time. There you go, got it, perfect. These guys right here are gonna go down into there, just like that, just like that. Actually, I think they might go from the other end. Look and see how the other compressor was. Almost there. No joke, they can get the best of the best technicians in the world. Sometimes it's the easiest thing. So let me see. It's just a matter of, let's see if I can do this with my left hand. There you go. Okay. Put those in, put that in that back corner, and we're ready to lift this guy into there. When lifting these compressors, use your screwdriver as leverage on the lifting point right there. Makes it a little bit easier. Just carefully rotate it in. And sometimes when you're putting these in, you can rip the plugs out because you push it too hard and it pulls it right out. So you wanna lift the compressor as much as possible into place. We pulled the top plug and pressure shot out, which is what you want. You want it to be pressurized. They come with a holding charge typically. And if you do everything right, we already sanded everything. That should just pop right in there. Just give it a whack. There you go, move the compressor around. We might have to heat it up, but sometimes you get it to slide in. So when you're putting the, uh, 
the Viper wet rag compound on here, you want to be very careful to make sure that it doesn't get anywhere near your braze joint. So we pushed it on this one up here, but we made sure that it was nowhere near the ridge of where the copper is because we want to protect it as much as possible and you don't want it to contaminate the, the places. And where it usually happens is on the bottom where you can't see it as much. But this one looks good. We're probably going to put a little bit more just to kind of dissipate the heat and make it you know go a little bit smoother and then we're going to go ahead and get the dryer ready and pack it around the dryer too we already cut the dryer out on one side right here we cut one side and then we unsweat the other side we're going to get a new dryer put on this guy the viper wet rag by refrigeration technologies love this stuff it doesn't dye your hands blue or anything the dye doesn't come out of it the only thing to understand about this stuff is this just displaces the heat so there's, there's moisture in the putty and that absorbs the heat while you're doing what you need to do. But there's gonna come a point when it can't absorb any more heat, then it's gonna transfer the heat. So the key is to get this stuff brazed and get that wet rag compound off as fast as possible. Um, so that way you're not compromising any components or, uh, and you can tell too, I mean, it's, it's inevitable that it's gonna get hot, but when you have to like scrape this stuff off after you're done like when it gets stuck to it that's because it's doing its job it's getting hot um, and you can reuse it you you pull it off you put it back in here and just put a little moisture in there pack it up and it'll you know be you know have its consistency back and everything so so we got everything prepped we got the dryer installed we went in with the sporlin catch-all 16.3 so it's a 16 cubic inch 3 8 line size we went oversized on the dryer um, and then uh, We've got everything packed with the Viper wet rag all around it. We've kind of got a game plan. We have a towel protecting some wires in the back. So we're gonna get started on this guy. So we're starting with what we think to be the hardest braze joint, which is the one where we're gonna have to work upside down, but we're doing the top first. So that way the heat energy heats up the bottom and we don't have to worry about it. Everything is sweat in you know it's not perfect we have little spots where we have burn marks and stuff it's okay it's not the end of the world all right one thing I will say is they don't do a very good job of securing stuff in these units there's really no strapping maybe we can strap it to the other lines but we went ahead and went with an oversized sporling catch-all we with a 16 cubic inch they had an 8 cubic inch in there um, I like going oversized on the dryers we're done brazing compressor sweat in we put the coupling up here we're just uh, hooking up the electrical. We're doing a tightness test with the gauges right now. We're looking good so far. So uh, we'll do the evacuation running here in a few minutes. So the restaurant is open and we were doing a pressure test, but we wanted to go take a lunch while that was happening. So we went ahead and put all the panels back on and started the unit up. Um, it passed the pressure test. Uh, we lost like 0.4 PSI or something. I'm not too concerned about it. So. Yeah, we're looking good. Everything's in. We're just going to uh, get ready to pull our evacuation. We can do that with the door and stuff where it is. Um, yeah, so that's it. We're just gonna start the evacuation, start cleaning up all of our messes. Well, moisture came from somewhere, cause look at that oil. That is white. We're gonna do an oil change on this guy. 
So it's an on the fly oil change, which I really dig about the field piece pump. Just drain it, there, pour it in. All while doing the evacuation, you're good to go. Make sure we don't overfill. There's something going on in there. We'll give it some time. We might have to do another oil change again. This is really interesting. Look at this oil. We didn't do anything to introduce that much moisture into the system. I'm wondering if their oil's contaminated in their brand new compressor. I, I don't understand. We're gonna keep trying to do oil changes on this, but there's no reason for this because we purged with nitrogen. We had nitrogen flowing. Um, yeah, unless the nitrogen's contaminated. I've never seen that before. That was interesting. Well, we're gonna keep doing oil changes. I've got a couple other little guys here, so just keep doing them and hope that oil clears up. It's kind of crazy, um, but the evacuation's doing good. We have, we're just doing a one hose pull. We have the micron gauge on the liquid line port and it's down to in the 900s now. So it's doing good and it's, every oil change is getting better. It's kind of clearing up, but good gosh, look at how nasty that oil is. The more I think about it, you know, we could have uh, contamination um, from the, this unit's only two years old, or no, it's it's like just over a year, I think, old. And uh, it could be contaminated from the factory. That or this oil's contaminated in here. We could just be cleaning the system up because the old compressor was locked up. If they don't ask for the compressor back, then I'll cut it open, but it is under warranty. We were trying to count how many oil changes we've done. It's been a lot. It's somewhere between six and eight is our thought. Um, but some of these are full of oil too. So yeah, it's a mess. But um, we're currently at 491 microns. So we're doing good. We're about ready to do a decay test and see where it lands. A million oil changes later. We are currently at 461 microns right now. I don't know how well that comes across. 461. And uh, I mean, it's doing okay. The oil's finally staying clear. But I mean, every one of those containers is full of that nasty oil. Like I said earlier, I don't know where this contamination came from. I don't know if that's what caused the original compressor to fail. That's a good possibility. Or if the new compressor, the oil was contaminated from the factory. I would think that, I mean, is it possible that from the old compressor, there's that much moisture in the piping? I guess it's possible. It's interesting though. It's kind of bizarre. Well, we're gonna start a decay test. See how fast it rises. We'll give it a few minutes. It's looking pretty darn good. I mean, it's still in decay right now, but I'm gonna call it at this. It's not gonna get much better than this guy. You can see that it's clearly just moisture and it, you know, because if it was a leak, it would be almost a straight rise. And we're slowly rising, but it's looking good. So measure quick is already, actually uh, the BlueVac app has given me the all clear saying that we passed it. So um, we're gonna go ahead and uh, get ready to charge this guy now. All right, I've got this drum and it might only have a pound or two in it. It's it's bare, almost empty, but we're gonna try to get as much of that into the system while the system is uh, in a vacuum. That way it'll suck in most of it. So uh, let's turn this guy on, this guy's on, this guy's on. Uh, I purged as I was putting them on. That's how I was able to add these. So we're gonna go ahead and uh, open that, open that. And we'll go ahead and charge as much as we can into the system. It's just vapor, so I'm gonna put it in on the low side too. Get it to take as much as possible. Turn this guy off. And then once it's done taking that, we'll get a full drum. We have a brand new drum right here. And this is 410A. All right, it took just under five pounds. Our total charge is seven, so we need to turn it on and meter the rest in through the low side. So we're gonna come over here to the menu. We're gonna go to service, test, cool. Both stages, go ahead and shut that door and we're gonna add gas until we get to Seven pounds, four ounces is what that guy says, so. Compressor's running. I have a feeling, I don't know if the customer's gonna approve it or not, but it would be really smart if we come over and change this dryer in a couple weeks and change all the refrigerant again. 
That would be a smart move with whatever contamination is in here, but I don't know if they'll approve it or not. Okay, we are running. It's looking good. It's uh, you know, it's hard to see right now. There you go. Got a 44 degree evaporator coil right now. Head pressure, condensing temp's about 113 degrees. It's just about 100 degrees outside, so maybe just a little under, 95 or something like that. Oh yeah, we gotta pull the micron gauge off. Forgot about that. Luckily, this micron gauge can handle positive pressure, but definitely need to be careful about doing that. Um, and here's the cap for that guy. There you go, put that on there. And uh, yeah, we're gonna wrap this one up, but 39 degree evaporator coil, but that's because we just opened the door. 110 degree condensing temp, seems fine to me. Customer's gonna be happy having a second stage on this unit, and uh, I, I hope that that compressor, they don't want it back because I wanna cut it open and find out if it has uh, copper plating in it. All right, the manufacturer's giving me the okay to go ahead and throw this compressor away, meaning they didn't want it back for warranty inspection, so. I'm gonna go ahead and uh, cut it open myself and see why it failed. So we had sealed this the day that we changed it. So we really shouldn't have very much outside moisture contamination. Um, so this thing has plenty of oil in it. Filling up a bucket right now. We just lobbed off the ends that I had braced shut. So we're just letting it drain into here. It'll take a couple ups and downs. All right, I've never cut an LG compressor open, so they're a little bit different than what I'm used to. I cut Copeland's open majority of the time, some Tecumseh's, but not a Tecumseh scroll. Um, this one has a three point on the bottom for the bottom, what do you want to call it, bearing race or whatever, bearing bracket. Um, so far I don't see a lot of copper plating going on in here, but I do already see an issue. So down in the bottom, there's something metallic down here. Don't know what that's for. It's magnetic too, interesting, right? And then right up in here, um, I've already see something broken up in here. There's a broken piece that I did not cut. This thing definitely had some overheat going on. Look at the purple tarnish they have going in there. Look at that. Um, on another note too, uh, the welds on this compressor were not that good. Not all of them, but majority of them, I was able to just break off with a small screwdriver. They didn't get very good penetration. This one I had to cut off or grind off but this one and this one on these two sides right here they literally just popped off by putting a screwdriver and pop they, they were almost like tack welds um stator looks fine besides my marks i don't see any issues there we'll get in here to the overload later and look at that but i don't see any issues in there i told you i'd win it's really interesting because this top part of the scroll assembly is held in by pressure so I had to carefully cut down the side right here and it popped on me. And if you look in here, there's a lip. There's a little lip and you can see where it's held on by pressure. That's really interesting. All right, so now you can kind of see what's in here. And we have to look at the damage that I did too because I did damage in here trying to cut this thing because I didn't know where it was. So that's me. But we got to go through this and try to find what was broken, what, you know, interesting. Oh, you know what? No. Oh, this might have been me. No, I don't know. This could have been me, this piece being broken right here. I don't know. I'm going to keep investigating. We'll see. All right, so further investigation, I did not cut this, okay? It's not, it's not clean. Um, this was broken. This is stuck down in it because um, that, that must have been broken inside the compressor number one look at that this is interesting too there is right in here th there's just like this gap right here right and then look at the top of this where the top of the um shaft sticks in here there's like crap down in there this is just junk looks like maybe some flooded start situations right here um, but look at the inside of that. Look at how, look at the coloring on that. This is definitely, I believe, yeah, and look at the copper plating going on in there. So, um, that moisture, I believe, was in this compressor. Uh, we had severe overheat situations. Look at the tarnish right there. Um, I think that the new compressor, I don't think that the 
the moisture from the evacuation had anything to do with that. On another note too, you know, this is really interesting because even though this is a scroll compressor, there was like, again, forgive my ignorance here, but there was like reeds on that. Kind of like in a piston driven compressor that has a reed. I mean, you had a double setup here. It's really interesting how LG does this. Like, I, I don't know, it's really interesting. But yeah, I'm gonna say that the moisture problem in the evacuation that I saw, it was in this compressor and I believe I was just pulling the remaining moisture from the system. Um, look at the, the rifling or whatever you wanna say inside there too. Um, forgive me, I don't know all the technical terms for all these parts in this guy, but I'm gonna say that this was caused um, by the customer's lack of preventative maintenance. Uh, they run with uh, broken belts quite often. Um, this particular customer, we have a lot of issues there. And uh, I do have to say, though, that I'm not a super fan. Oh, that's interesting. The whole inside of this thing is very interesting how that's not perfect curve. I'm sure there's reasons for all of this, but yeah. If anybody has any information on LG compressors, cutaways, breakdowns, or anything like that, or contacts at LG, I'd love for them to talk to me and uh, help me to analyze what is going on here. But yeah, this is almost like an old ham coupling, like on the Copeland scroll compressors, I believe. Um, and that, I believe, was broken inside there, and that's what caused the locked up situation. Um, but look in here, too. Look at all this. I don't think that's from my... That's a lot of contamination. I don't think that's from me cutting with the grinder. I don't think so. I don't think it made it all the way into there. That's really interesting, though. I mean, I guess it's possible. But, yeah, this guy's done. All right, cool. Well, um, my, uh, my curiosity has been uh, satisfied here. I just kind of wanted to see what was going on in there. All right. That one started off as just a service call on their restrooms being hot, right? And then... I really didn't have a lot of footage, didn't find a whole lot wrong except for it was a little bit low on refrigerant and I couldn't find a leak, but to be fair, I didn't hit the system with nitrogen, okay? As you guys saw in the video though, what I ended up finding was that there was a leaking Schrader. That's the only place I could find a refrigerant leak and when all was said and done in the very end when I changed the compressor, I did a pressure test and an evacuation and no other leaks were present. So the second time I went out there when I had pulled my, uh, went to go put my gauges on the cap blew off at me, meaning that there was refrigerant leaking out of the Schrader. So I did replace the Schraders. I didn't address that in the video, but I did, okay? So... Um, it's always important to, and I've said this before, and I mean, you know, sometimes I forget to do it too, but in all fairness, I didn't suspect a leak in the very beginning. Okay. But if you ever suspect a leak on a system, right. And you're confident there's an actual leak, it's best not to apply service gauges to the system and to do a quick leak search. Okay. Of course you don't want to waste your time if the system's completely out of refrigerant, but it's kind of a cool thing. At least check the Schrader caps and the Schraders before you apply gauges, you know, just to make sure, because in my situation, my leak was on a Schrader valve. And when I applied my service gauges, I concealed the leak. Therefore, I couldn't find it when I was doing my initial leak check. Now, I do want to address something that on the micro channel condensers, um, they can be very difficult to check proper charge and sometimes especially in my situation i had a very low ambient or i mean very low um space temperature down in the occupied space so we had really really low return air temperature essentially no load on the system so it was kind of concealing the refrigerant related issues um, my pressures didn't look horrible. They weren't where they should be, but they weren't like screaming at me. Hey, this thing's two pounds low on refrigerant, you know, but, um, it certainly, I believe those pressures would have been, I mean, the, the, the symptoms of the low charge would have been amplified if we had a higher indoor, um, uh, temperature and or load coming back up the return airstream into the AC. I think that it would have been amplified and we would have seen it a little bit more, a little bit easier basically okay so in that situation on these micro channel condensers um, it was just easier in my opinion if you suspect anything just go ahead and recover the charge pull the charge weigh it back in that's the best way um, you know when it's just not completely obvious okay so I went ahead and uh, found that the unit was a little low on refrigerant added the refrigerant and the system seemed to be operating somewhat decent Okay, yeah, it was the superheat was a little bit low and stuff, but remember we had no load in the building. So that's pretty expected. Okay um, 
In the very beginning, though, there was a clip where when I first walked up, I found that the system had um, had uh, a lot of freeze stat errors, okay? Meaning that the evaporator coil was getting too cold and there's a little thermostat, clicks on thermostat, that said, hey, it's getting too cold and it sent an error message to the board and typically it shuts the unit down. I told you that there was like 20 of them. I, I may have been exaggerating, but there was a lot. There was a lot of error codes for freeze stat in there, okay? And we had a loose belt, okay? Um, this is a symptom of uh, improper maintenance of the equipment. The customer wasn't doing enough preventative maintenances, okay? Now, there's reasons behind that with all the craziness of everything and budgets and everything, okay? So that's a whole nother thing, but bottom line, uh, my personal opinion of this complete analysis, compressor analysis and everything is that this was caused by improper preventative maintenance, the lack thereof of preventative maintenance leading to uh, flooded starts and flood back, in my opinion, okay? Now, um, uh, I have a couple notes right here that I wanted to talk about. The temperature checks across the dryer was an important one to, while we're going through our analysis to make sure that we're not um, restricted out of dryer, okay? So when I was suspecting like, hey, why is the superheat so low? But then I realized, hey, it was the load, the low load, but still, the superheat was weird. The liquid line temperature was weird, the difference between the two compressors. Um, but I just, before I recovered the charge, wanted to verify that there was no issues with the liquid line filter dryers, okay? So we went ahead and did that. Um, some of the other things that I checked was the VFD, okay? Again, I'm trying to figure out if there's something going on with the system because at that point in the video, I didn't know that it was low on charge yet. So I'm like, okay, we had a lot of freeze stats. Things are a little bit wonky, but I wanted to check to see if the VFD was working properly. This system has a two-speed variable frequency drive, okay? So it, it uh, changes between two speeds. Whenever first stage calls, it runs on low speed. Whenever second stage calls, if second stage calls, first stage is running on this particular setup, okay? So um, whenever you get a Y2 call, both compressors run, it speeds up to whatever the max setting is on the VFD. They do this to save energy, okay? For the longest time, when we didn't have two-speed blowers on our equipment, we were actually wasting energy and um, not only wasting electricity running the blower on high, but then we weren't getting the full efficiency of the heat transfer and the, um, you know, or the proper heat transfer because on a first stage call for cool on one of these older package units that didn't have two speed blowers, you would be running your blower at the proper uh, CFMs or air speed or airflow, whatever, for both compressors, okay? So you'd be moving the air too fast with just one compressor. So that's something that um, newer efficiency equipment is gonna do. It's gonna have two speed fans. They're bumping that into refrigeration too to try to squeeze as much efficiency out of this equipment, okay? Um, I already talked about recovering the gas. That was super important on this thing, okay? And um, the broken scroll, you know, down to the autopsy of the compressor, right? Um, that... I believe was caused by flooded starts. I believe that, I believe it's an old ham coupling, or at least that's what Copeland calls it on theirs. Um, I believe that broke, and because before I cut the scroll, the top of the compressor apart, I had cut just the bottom open, and I cut the bottom off the compressor, and I could not get the, the, the motor to rotate, or the shaft to rotate inside the compressor. So it was clearly stuck before I cut the top of it open, okay? So that's why after I was analyzing everything, I was like, wait, I didn't cut that piece apart. That piece was broken. I believe that happened from flooded starts, from um, you know improper maintenance on the equipment. Clearly had some overheat issues. Now, down to the really confusing part, where in the heck did that moisture come from, okay? That one is still a mystery to me. I saw some copper plating in the compressor, but the more I think about it, I just don't know, okay? I don't know if I had contaminated nitrogen. You would think if I had contaminated nitrogen, which I've never had, but I've always been curious about, if I had contaminated nitrogen, I've used that nitrogen several times since. You think I would have ran into these problems. I never ran into another problem on that tank, okay? Um, it could have been in the system existing from day one, sure, okay? That, that unit was like a year and a half old. I guess it could have been that, but I didn't see damage really as much copper plating as I would expect to see in that compressor, okay? If that moisture was in there in the first place. Another thought that I had in my head was, um, uh, you know, it could have been contamination added to the system after the fact, you know, from people working on it, I guess. It's, 
it was a really mystery to me to figure out where in the heck that moisture came from. I have never seen that much moisture in an evacuation. I've seen some, but never that much. That was a lot, okay? Um, and I was blown away by that. I guess, I guess it's always possible that it was in the new compressor, okay? Um, man, if it's in the new compressor, it's probably not going to last that long, but the evacuation went pretty smooth. If it was in the new compressor, I don't expect that I would have pulled the evacuation that I did and passed the decay test in the way that I did. Paying attention to the decay test and looking at that bar graph, it definitely didn't have a leak, right? Because if it had a leak in the decay test, you would have seen it go spike right up on that. And, and we just saw a gradual increase and it was rather minor, right? Um, we pulled after I did so many oil changes and I did run the gas ballast open for a very long time too, trying to clear that crap out. Um, but we did, uh, you know, pass everything. So I don't know. The, the moisture was a mystery. Uh, the customer has not approved us to go back and do dryer changes or refrigerant changes or anything like that. Um, I tried to bring it up, but you know, it's just kind of, they just want to see what happens. So there's a very good possibility we may be back out there um, in a year or so to change another compressor. Hopefully, if if it is still in the system, it doesn't lead to any catastrophic failures like grounded compressors, burnouts, anything like that. But it's hard to say, right? We do our best. I try my best. I'm not the best at everything, you know. I just just try. I just I'm curious. I dig into things, you know. So um, I'm sure there's going to be a lot of other points and topics that people make in the comments, feel free to send me an email, hvacrvideos at gmail.com. Uh, let me know what you think. Where in the heck did that moisture come from? Why do you think that compressor failed in the way that it did? I was thinking from the flooded starts is what I'm thinking. Um, you know, but again, it's, it's one of those things. I think that's what happened, but it's hard to say. So feel free to let me know what you think down in the comments. If you guys haven't already, if you're interested in doing so, please check out my website, hvacrvideos.com. It's a great way to help support the channel. We have merchandise available on there. These hats, sweaters, beanies, hoodies. I say it probably too much, but any support you guys can give would be amazing. There's a couple other ways you guys can help support the channel. Um, PayPal, Patreon, YouTube channel memberships. There's links in the show notes. Those are the ways that you can just donate money. Um, super chats during live streams of which I do live streams Monday evenings, 5 p.m. Pacific work permitting on YouTube on my channel where I answer and address comments. I'm sure I'll be addressing a lot of the questions from this video on this Monday's live stream. Um, also, if you guys are interested in purchasing any tools uh, and uh, you want to help support the channel, you can go to truetechtools.com. Uh, if you like their pricing and you like the selection of tools that they have, I have an offer code, big picture, one word. Uh, that'll get you an 8% discount on your order as of today, 1127 of 21. Um, and you know, something that I don't ever do, uh, or actually real quick before I get into that. Uh, also, if you guys know what you're going to purchase, shoot me an email. I can generate an affiliate link. That gets me a little bit more of a commission because if you use my offer code, I get a little bit of a commission. And then also if you use an affiliate link, which is just I generate a link, you click it and you purchase something, I get just a little bit more of a commission from you doing that. And you still get to use the offer code big picture. OK, so one thing I do want to ask of you guys, if if you you want to help support the channel, there's another way you could do so too, is just by simply spreading the word about the channel, okay? If you have friends or anybody that you think would like these videos, technicians that you think they would help, share the information, share the links, okay? You can also share uh, the information about my affiliate code with True Tech Tools. If you know of any technicians that do like my content, um, you know, you can let them know that they can also help to support the channel by using the offer code big picture one word. Um, those are just great ways to help support it. Okay. Um, stay tuned, uh, here in the next couple weeks, we have something really, really cool coming up. A lot of people have been expecting some things. I don't think that people expected the way that I'm going to do this because it's kind of, uh, you know, I don't. I don't like to announce things, but this has to do with the end of the year. And for some of you that are normal followers of the channel, you probably know what I'm talking about. Okay, I've kind of been teasing this a little bit, but um, just pay attention. You'll see a cool video coming out. Uh, I've been super excited. We've really been getting down working on this thing lately. And uh, I'm just really happy to be able to do this kind of stuff. So thank you guys so very much for watching. Thanks for all the support. I really do appreciate you. Uh, be kind to one another, guys. Okay, and uh, we will catch you on the next one.